You're listening to Precinct 444, a podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. Today, we're bringing you an episode from Icons, where listeners are introduced to incredible people working within law enforcement who have had a profound impact on the community. These one-on-one interviews provide insight into their lives and careers so we can better understand their challenges and recognize their bravery, commitment, and sacrifice. In segment three of the story of the First Net Authority, you'll hear from Chris Moore and Sue Swenson about the hesitation among commercial carriers and first responders and the convincing it took on their part to present this as a necessity to each and every person who would listen. And now for segment three of the story of the First Net Authority. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure to be interviewing you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Before we even get into how FirstNet evolved, how it came to be. I want the listeners to hear about your interesting background, and I'm going back years. I understand the breadth of experience you have in public safety. It, it transcends the, the work with the police. Can you tell us about that? Certainly. Uh, you know, when I was a young person in high school, uh, I had a brother who worked as a volunteer firefighter and found myself involved with a volunteer fire program when I was 17, 18 years old. Did that for a couple of years during my first few years of college. Uh, and that's where I thought I was actually heading. Uh, and, you know, Jeff Johnson talks about this all the time. Who, who leaves police work to go, or who leaves firefighting to go to police work? But there you go. Um, did that, ended up working in law enforcement over in Berkeley at UC Berkeley and then uh, when I was going to school. And then went down to San Jose and applied for both the police test and the fire test back in the, in the early 80s. And uh, was told bluntly that uh, you need to pick one or the other. And at that point, I'd already been a police officer for three years. So I figured that's what I'd do. Uh, there's more to that story, as you know, Bill. But it's just, it's one of those life changes that happens. The events that happen, you don't have anything to do with it. You just go with the flow. It's been a great career anyway. Spent uh, a good chunk of my career, almost all of it, San Jose, 28 years in San Jose. Uh, I took a couple detours. I did spend a year here in Washington, D.C. as a White House fellow. Served as counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno back in 99, 2000. Served on a Fulbright fellowship over at Scotland Yard uh, in 2004. So I've always come back to the department, the police department, uh, continued to go through different assignments, uh, had ran everything from internal affairs to field training um, to community services to ran the, the press information shop on behalf of one chief and then uh, you know worked through every chief Every rank all the way. I was, I was told right before I retired that uh, I'd actually been the first person since statehood to actually hit every rank on the way up to become the chief. Now, they've had a couple since then after me, but nonetheless. Now, uh, am I correct? And tell me if I'm wrong. Didn't you also have experience as an EMT? I did. As part of the fire department, this was early on because a lot of firefighters were not EMTs. Now, almost every, if not every firefighter in the country is an EMT, and some are, a lot of them are paramedics. But in the early days, uh, you know, that was something extra that you had to do, and you got paid a little extra as well. So I remember going to, uh, I was taking fire science classes. I have a fire science degree as well, and under, I mean, an associate degree, but part of that program was uh, an EMT. So, I mean, it's a good background to have whether you're in public safety or not, just making sure that when you're out and about traveling that I've used that, those skills probably more in the private sector or myself just as a person than actually on duty. Although I have to assume that since you have all the first responder tickets punched, so to speak, it must have come in handy in terms of later understanding the perspectives, the issues they face, and therefore maybe even the resistances you might face. Well, I think so. I think any experience you're going to get is going to inform, you know, whatever situation you face. And, and again, I had a, a you know, deep abiding uh, love for the fire service. I thought it is a great profession, but law enforcement, I mean, you touch people even more so every day. Uh, and then the, EM, you know, the EMS side, just my hats off to all those folks who, particularly during the pandemic, but anytime, uh, they're out there, they're, you know, hearts of gold, taking care of people. That's what their job is, and they do it well. So during those earlier years, when you were doing many things, including a number of years of police work, the one thing you didn't have experience in, technology, is what you got thrust into. Tell us about that. As the story goes, uh, I spent the majority of my career in uniform in the field, particularly early on, uh, and that's what I loved the most. I get a fateful phone call from my then chief of police uh, who said, I need somebody to come run technology for the police department. I said, sir, I think you have the wrong person. I, got, I, I don't know anything about this stuff. And I was trying to figure out who threw me under the bus and I was trying to figure out who I was going to throw under the bus to see if I could get out of this. 
because chiefs still usually don't make those phone calls directly to lieutenants asking favors. Um, so, but I, I came real close to telling him to pound sand that probably would have been a career ending decision, but nonetheless, uh, he said, no, it's, uh, it's not about technology. It's about ability to lead and we haven't had it. And everybody I talked to says, you're it. And I said, sir, I'm on board. What do you need? And that's when I started to learn about terms like bandwidth. I had no idea what. And that was that became a real issue, right, with the patrol cars and the GPS uh, that they were equipped with. It, what happened was we had a, a failure of a brand new CAD system that had been years in the planning and many millions in, uh, in the project. And when they threw the switch, uh, it didn't work and they couldn't figure out why. And these are the biggest companies around that really ought to have known better. That said, I don't ever want to blame the vendors completely because our, our side, our folks, clearly there was a failure of leadership to make sure it was tested because you don't take a mission critical system like your CAD system for a city of a million people, something you rely upon for life and death decisions uh, and not test it before you throw the switch. So um, we figured out what the problem was. It was insufficient bandwidth for the new technology we were bringing in. Then the question is, okay, how do we get the bandwidth? And uh, when our vendor at the time, when I pressed him to say, okay, how long is it going to take to fix and how much? The answer was, you know, $21 million in three years. And I said, don't have $21 million. I certainly don't have three years. So plan B, escorted him out of the building and went to the staff and said, okay, we know what we need to do. Let's find it. And it was, you know, if you can't buy bandwidth, how do you lease it? And I, again, I still get my arms around, you know, too much water, not enough pipe, too many cars, not enough freeway. That's bandwidth. In effect, the way I was taught, it's okay. You, you just don't, you're putting a lot of information downstream that needs to get there. But if you don't have the pipe to get it there, that's a, you know, it's a point of failure that you just have to overcome. So broadband started to expand. That's how I got to know. You become a little more knowledgeable than the rest of your major city chief colleagues. And then all of a sudden you become the point person because you know just a little bit more. I believe you told me in an earlier conversation that one response you got, how can I get more bandwidth, really infuriated you. And it had to do with you're too small a player to worry with. That's absolutely the truth. And even the carriers today, all of them, those that were around at the time, uh, basically said, hey, look, I went to them and said, look, we need bandwidth. I need it now. So, well, and I, what we really wanted was what we now call priority and preemption, ruthless preemption, as Chuck coined, is we don't need it all the time everywhere. But when we do need it, we may need it all, not everywhere, but in a specific geographic location. Witness a large fire someplace, which takes out a city block or whatever, and you've got fire rigs coming in from elsewhere, or let's say a plane crash or, you know. Things that do not occur, you know, regularly, but do occur. And we need the access to the bandwidth to be able to communicate. The more units come in, you become saturate an existing network. The response from the carriers, that's nice, but you're too small of our market share, quite frankly, to be that important. And that really did, it torqued me, it torqued a lot of other public safety folks, but we didn't, we weren't organized. Uh, and historically, police, fire, and EMS have never gotten on the same page, even locally or regionally, much less nationally. So it was sort of fortuitous after I, my frustration trying to move to some sort of preemption to say, okay, if we can't do it that, what's the alternate path? And that's when I met Chuck Dowd in San Diego. You know, he was from NYPD at the time running their communication center. And, and uh, within a couple hours, we had figured out the basics of a plan uh, to move the ball forward for what is now FirstNet. And that resulted in, as I understand it, a letter you crafted together over lunch that was ultimately meant for the FCC chairman. We did. Uh, the, it, if you go back in time, and I know Harlan you know, put his heart and soul and effort to uh, the previous effort to get the D block on behalf of public safety uh, in a public partnership. It just, the time was wrong. I think the players were wrong uh, or not. As, you know, it just didn't happen. And it rained into Roblox. So basically, the auction failed for the spectrum. And the FCC was going to take it back. And again, I remember that day when I met Chuck at 10 a.m. in the morning. And by noon, we were like, okay, how are we going to fix this? We're going to lose the spectrum forever. Because once spectrum's gone, it's not coming back. So we said, okay, well, we need the major city chiefs to write a letter to the FCC chair to say, just stop any further auctions for now. Let public safety get reorganized. And of course, I guarantee you, nobody in that room of those chiefs had any idea what the D block was. Yet our letter, I must say, between the two of us, we knocked something out pretty good in, in about an hour and then put together. So right after lunch, we got them to pass it, send it. Uh, we were, I was an old PIO, so I know how to put out, you know, if not a press release, get it to the right people, copies of the letter. So they got put out there more globally with respect to the trade press. And next thing you know, we're off and running. And then I was told by uh, the executive director of major city chief at the time, Tom Frazier said, nice job guys. He says, but have you ever heard of the pottery barn rule? I said, uh, what notes that, sir? He says like, you broke it, you own it. 
So I said, well, okay, what do you mean by that? Well, so now you, you put a stop on this thing. Now you have to figure out something to do with all the public safety. And I said, well, give me some time to think about it. And we ended up having a meeting here down the street at the uh, Renaissance Hotel where we convened all the presidents and executive directors in, in April of 2009. Said, look, is it important enough to you for the future of technology for public safety? And they all said, absolutely. So you know, I remember Harlan saying, Chris, you're going to have to lead this. And if you do, I won't oppose you. And I said, Harlan, I don't need you not to oppose me. I need you to support this. And we really, and he's been a great partner. I know it was frustrating for him, you know, having gone through what he went through with the previous iteration um, with Siren Call. But look, he's he's a guy who's been there since the very beginning. And I think he may have mentioned to you, he could tell you about this soup to nuts, and I'm sure probably has. Um, but it took everybody, all of us from police, fire, EMS, from the radio side, 911, to come together to say this is this is what we need to do and no one's going to stop us frankly and, and i want to get back to that meeting and actually some other meetings but but before we leave since you were talking about a letter going off to the fcc chair at some point the realization came about that you couldn't put your trust in the fcc to get things done is that something you can talk about oh absolutely the, the chair of the fcc that position you know holds a lot of sway on a lot of different issues and have influences from business and from government from all those things and I think his attitude at the time was very similar to what the carriers was, which is, look, you guys are important. Don't get me wrong. It's just not that important. That's not his words. That's my words. But that was the, the, what we were. And they, he sort of told us and others on his behalf that, you know, they weren't going to say anything about um, just giving it up or giving it to public safety as part of the national broadband plan, which was coming out soon after. Uh, unfortunately, we were told they weren't going to mention anything and Right across town, the chairman was speaking at an event saying we're going to auction off without condition, which left public safety. And that really, that's one thing, public safety, for, for all those who are listening, uh, politicians, uh, public safety understands we don't win all arguments. Sometimes we think we should, but we don't. Uh, but we think we're reasoned in, in our approach. And we can all disagree and we'll all be fine. Do not lie to public safety. If you lie to us, your persona and I go right, and we will, you know, we, we just can't trust you. It's, it's hard to gain trust in our community, but once you do, you're good. But doesn't take long. So that's what happened here in, in this case. And I remember getting a call from the chairperson personally to apologize, not for the decision, but for the communication of the decision. I said, sir, you, I don't think you understand. You know, it's real easy for you to just tell us I'm not going to do it. And this is why. We'd live with it and, and we're going to be fine. But don't tell us to our face a bald face lax. It's just not going to work. Anyway, long and short was we were able to uh, decide at that point the FCC was not the path we needed to go down. And again, I say that now because past, present, and I, I'm sure future public safety or FCC commissioners are all great people. They are. They're hardworking, and, and I've, I've met many of them, and I don't ever question anything other than sometimes politically you get stuck in situations and you have to do so. But with public safety, it's just too important is stick to your guns, say what you're going to say, but don't deviate from that. So I'll leave, leave it there. Again, not a criticism of the FCC because like clearly right now the FCC, the current FCC, and again, others, have, uh, I have nothing but the utmost respect. Uh, the current chairwoman uh, was somebody who was there at the time when we did the first night. She was uh, uh, chairwoman Rosenworcel was on the Senate staff for Senate Rockefeller, who was one of our champions. So uh, a shout out to her and many other unsung heroes uh, that, that made this happen. So pivoting then to we, you know, we've got to we've got to address Capitol Hill and, and get them on board. This relates to the meeting you were just talking about. I assume that to get government on board, they have to see a united front from public safety. So that was the that was the big lift that had to happen at that meeting. And I remember you telling me once that your basic message to them was, hey, if, if we're not all behind this, tell me now and let's not waste our time. That was the premise of the meeting is if it's important to us and they all agreed it was, then this is what we need to do. Mind you, this was in 2009. We were coming off reeling, you know, the, the Great Recession. The pro, you know, it was, it was difficult. And the federal government was hemorrhaging money and looking for ways to get money, not spend money. And we were told that repeatedly, that that was the reason for not to do it. Um, public state had never come together before, police, fire, and EMS. They had basically everybody sort of parochial in their interest, going after their own grant funds. So this is going to take all of us, and we just don't have any support. You know, the FCC did not support us. The Republicans didn't support us. The Democrats didn't support us. The folks on the Hill, and, I mean, in, in the House and the Senate, nobody supported us. They liked us. They thought it was a good idea, but they just didn't support the idea. Just didn't think it was that important. So it then became incumbent upon us to say, okay, all right, 
if we're going to do this, we all have to do it together because the moment somebody splits off, they've got us and we're not going to go anywhere. So rule one, we do this together or we don't do it at all. So were you surprised that everyone was on board? Did you think you were going into a meeting that might just end the whole process? It was a distinct possibility. I, I did not know, honestly, beforehand. But I felt my argument was this, is I don't think even in tough economic times that Congress and everybody else in D.C. could ignore public safety as a united entity fighting for a thing that wasn't about us personally. It was about protecting our communities as well as this nation's capital and everything else. So it wasn't a, you know, a pork. They were saying you're a special interest. That really torqued us when they started calling us a special interest. Okay, if you want to call us a special interest, great. But the special interest is the American public and their safety. So you know, you, if that's the way you choose to describe it, then good on you, and we'll, you, we'll use that to our advantage. And we did. We literally we, we did some things that today were probably bold. Took out some full page ads, taking on some members of Congress that we, I didn't necessarily support that approach, but it was a consensus led effort. You know, everybody had to agree on something, but all the associations are all strong associations with strong leadership. And so they were all, everybody's trying to push out on the boundaries a little bit. My job is to sort of keep everybody together at the same time, respecting everybody, uh, everybody's autonomy as their own individual organization. So how we were able to get, I don't know. I just sometimes wonder there are times when this thing's going to just implode or explode. I'm not sure which, but uh, we were able to keep it together, kept the message the same. Uh, we, we, there was one time we did surround the Capitol with fire trucks, and police cars, thinking in hindsight, today's world, that's probably not a great idea, but it was very friendly. And we had uh, Senators Lieberman and McCain come over and speak in support of us. It was a hot day in, in July, I think. It was the summer anyway. I was in dark blue wool and we're all just sweating and poor, poor Senator McCain was, he had, couldn't stay in the sun very long. And, but we had a great press conference and, uh, at that point. But there was, you know, there was a couple of events that were it not for those events, despite all of our efforts, we probably wouldn't have gotten it. But, you know, divine and, intervention, things like that. And, and wasn't there a, a hinge moment, uh, a meeting in Herndon at which, as I understand it, Anish Chopra was present, who was the chief technology officer for the U.S., first one ever. And you had the, the top people from the major carriers. And you posed a question. I did. Just a little bit of context further. We, we were out in Herndon because we couldn't get a space big enough for like 400 people that we had there because uh, the AMA was having their medical convention here in D.C. So we we're way out there. We were testifying. I was testifying the next day in D.C., so I was in uniform. Uh, but we're out there, and the whole point was they had all the DOJ, and, and this is uh, and DHS and all the other representatives in the room, and then Anish, who was speaking for the White House on technology issues. And it really came down to this one question. They're kind of beating around the bush with some preliminaries. I just pointed the question first at the representative from, from Verizon, Don Birmingham, and then to Jim Bigel from at and I just said, I'm going to put it out there. I'm just going to ask you the question. Will you or your, your carrier, will your company ever provide ruthless preemption for public safety on your network? And honestly, I wasn't sure I was going to get a true answer or not, but I just I thought I'd put it out in front of everybody. And and uh, John Birmingham said no, and it was like a <sighs> moment. And I said, okay, why not? I mean, we're, we're reasonable people. Tell us why. It's not in our shareholders' interest. Bingo, perfect, got it. Okay, went over to ask the same question to Jim, and Jim goes, same answer, reason, same reason. You know, it's not in our shareholders' interest. You guys, the market's not big enough to do this. And it is rumored I was not close enough in the audience to hear this, but I know others in our group were, that Anish Chopra leaned over to somebody and said, I think we're gonna have to give him the spectrum. And that was one of those moments where you go, okay. And that was one of several that were tipping points, but that was a key one to be sure. Um, another one was we were trying to explain why it was important. They said, well, the networks are resilient. I said, to a point, uh, they don't have a lot of the backup that we would put in a public safety system. But what it really came down to is when a bad event happened, either man-made or, or naturally occurring, that the network doesn't collapse. Some of it might, but it doesn't as a whole collapse, but it becomes saturated. And if you think about any, even a ball game, like a Super Bowl or something like that, they have to bring in lots of extra capacity because people are you know, sending pictures back and forth and calling mom. Well, in a natural disaster, um, and in this case, it happened to be an earthquake on the East Coast, which in California, we get them all the time. It, you, know, you get a little bit of spike, it's just not a big deal. In D.C., post 9-11, when this happened, and I think it was in 2010 or 11 or something like that when it occurred, uh, for those here in D.C., you know, they had damage to the Washington Monument, to the, to the uh, National Cathedral. 
these were, you know, it was significant enough to do damage, but what it felt like to people up on Capitol Hill in their offices is that a bomb may have gone off. And they all ran out. What do they do when they are out? They get on the phones and they're trying to call and they're trying to send pictures and they're and and it just didn't it didn't work. Our point was it became saturated, unavailable to public safety. And it proved our point, divine intervention, that this is exactly, and this is a small scale, nobody got seriously hurt, which was great. There was some property damage, but it demonstrated the, the actual point we were trying to make is, look, when we need it, we need it, and it needs to be available. And those types of incidents, when they occur, tend to bring everybody else from the public on board so we don't get access to that spectrum. So that made the point. So that was another turning point, I think. That Mother Nature provided an aha moment for Absolutely. all those politicians. Absolutely. And uh, well, we would take it because we were at one of those moments where we were told you're not going to get it and we appreciate all the hard work but you know we were told probably three or four times along the way so you're done you're out you know you guys are just too dumb to know that you're dead and uh, which we probably were and then one wise sage told us actually you got them right where you want them which is you know they're scared they, they're afraid now that they know you you know you've got the message out there and you know again it has worked out so well that i don't think anybody that was involved that had concerns about the viability of it or that it was a good idea or a bad idea now they all pretty much agree it's a good idea and works. It's one of the best private public partnerships that's been, ever been established by the government. And by getting key players involved, you increasingly made it hard for those who were resisting to say no. And I'm thinking, for example, of Senator Rockefeller. Senator Rockefeller was one. We were you know, spreading out on the Hill on many days when we would come to DC and hit as many offices as we could get. We had you know, fire chiefs and police chiefs go see their representatives. You know, I was focused on the California delegation, which you know, had two senators and a whole lot of members of Congress. Um, and a, and a couple of those actually deserve uh, significant accolades and notice. And one would certainly be Anna Eshoo from Palo Alto in the Bay Area, a huge fan of interoperability for public safety, at the same time not spending a fortune on stuff we didn't need to spend a fortune on. Um, some of the radio systems and radios devices that we were buying and had been buying for decades, very, very expensive, good quality. They work, but the problem is they didn't have the ability to do what a smartphone does, not even close. Um, so, And they were spending a lot more than we would you know, I, I could spend literally five to eight thousand dollars on a handheld device that each one of my officers had to have, and it had a shelf life. Uh, granted, the shelf life was longer than uh, your typical cell phone upgrade. That said, though, it was you know the price differential between that and a five hundred dollar smartphone at that point um, just made it so you could replace it. Anyway, I, I just think Anna Eshoo was was you know there are several folks, um, Amy Klobuchar uh, in the Senate. You know, there's people in the House Energy and Commerce Committee that were very very supportive. At the beginning and all the way through, there were those that were not supportive and then became supportive because enough inertia had been established. And the likes of Lieberman and and uh, um, Rockefeller and uh, um, John McCain, you know, they all came on board and you, know, you started to see the momentum build. And they finally said, "Okay, this is the right thing to do." Then it was like, "What vehicle do you put it on?" Because it's it wasn't a large program. I mean, you know, when you're talking twenty billion worth of spectrum, I do say that that's important. And then the ability to use money from the sale of other spectrum, which was key because you know, the, the Treasury has, you know, you have this rule that says you, you just can't go buy something unless you can find an offset for it. And the offset was the, the spectrum that was being sold. And we appreciated uh, the likes of Senator Rockefeller, uh, Chair of Senate Commerce, and, and particularly uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, who's now our FCC Chair, who was there helping get, shepherd that through. Uh, again, a lot of success has many fathers and mothers. It's so true. Uh, and so we get the group of us, the four of us and others get a lot of credit, which, you know, sure we deserve some, but at the end of the day, unless everybody played the part that they played, we wouldn't have been successful. Was there ever a, a point, a moment, or based on some event, maybe when President Obama mentioned it in the State of the Union, was there ever a moment where you said, you know what, nothing's gonna stop this now. This is definitely gonna happen. You never say in this town, you know, anything can happen as we've seen. Uh, but certainly that White House meeting or the, uh, the meeting out in Herndon was one where you go, you know, I think we have some momentum here. And people started to jump on board quietly. Um, there was also the time when, uh, you know, the, you spoke of the State of the Union. We had gotten word that, again, to anybody that's worked in Washington, to even get a mention in the State of the Union is a huge deal. Um, we weren't really seeking it, but it was part of what the middle class tax relief act was going to be was actually signed shortly thereafter of the so part of the talking points were things that were in that and one of them was a public safety network so he he didn't mention the d block he didn't mention but he did get us a line or his staff got us a line in there which you know for most people like they wouldn't even know if they heard that line what it really meant but for those of us who involved as long as they get not only get it 
through the House and then into the Senate now waiting a signature from the president uh, knew what it was. That was a big deal. So, so as, day. as we all know, FirstNet has been a remarkable success. I want to ask you as a final question, where do you see it going? What challenges need to still be addressed so it can evolve in the most effective way? So let me hit that in two parts. One, the latter part first, and that is, what do we need to do to make sure that it continues to succeed and thrive? Uh, number one, you know, the public-private partnership is a 25-year deal. Uh, that's huge. at t stepped up in a big way to make that happen. That said, they're a, they're a for-profit corporation with a board. It's really incumbent upon on the public, the, the, the network, the, the First Responder Network Authority Board, which is made up of a number of public safety people and others with experience, to make sure that all of the elements in that contract are met. I mean, I'm not only talking now, but moving forward. And to date, they have. But, you know, with changes in leadership over time and things happening on both the, the government side and the other side, interest in it wanes. People today were 10 years old, now are 10 years on from the legislation, and only five years from when they started the actual network, which has been wildly successful. You know, you have over, you know, uh, was it four million actual connections in a short period of time, and you've got twenty some thousand entities that are signed on to it, public safety entities. So, you know, huge numbers for a very short period of time. But again, memories fade, and if it just becomes part of something, there has to be an advocate on the public safety side to make sure that stuff continues to happen, and that there is um, of the product offerings to do our jobs better in public safety. So that's that's the second half. The first half, you know, moving forward. Um, really proud, but we we didn't know back then what it was going to look like. We knew technology was going to move forward, but we were designing a super highway for something we did not know what kind of cars or vehicles were going to be on it. We knew they would be there. There was a, an abiding faith in technology that our jobs are going to get easier or, or will be more effective with fewer people because people are expensive. We need to rely on technology. So we have to be pushing the technology and the applications and not let the vendors drive it. So that's been an overarching theme for all of this, which is public safety should be driving this and the vendors should respond to the needs and requirements of public safety. We've been in an era for you know 50 years where we were told you need this, so buy this. And oh, by the way, buy it at this price. So there was not a whole lot of competition. This is no disrespect people doing business the way they knew how to do business. But now it's public safety, we're gonna drive this, you need to do this. So to your point, what is it gonna look like 10, 15 years from now? The honest truth is, I don't know. And I don't know anybody else that does. But we know enough from the time 10 years ago to now how it's improved and how new things have happened. We got a rough idea that we will see new applications that require even more bandwidth over time. Uh, we're going to need to improve our infrastructure, uh, which is part of our complaint is we didn't have coverage the way we needed it nationwide. In the cities, it's actually pretty good. But out in rural America, where a lot of events like fires occur, we don't have that. So through the innovation of the rapid deployable, so you can have sort of bring your coverage with you, that's been a huge innovation in the last 10 years. It saved a lot of money and has actually provided coverage, you know, a terrestrial coverage in a way that, you know, short of going up to a satellite, which is very expensive, but is part of the portfolio that, you know, the AT&T FirstNet team has helped deploy. Uh, you, ha you saw what happened uh, in the latest hurricane in Florida. I mean, some of the, the techniques and the equipment that they were able to ferry out on, on a, a, you know, the, that uh, I want to call it a duck boat, it's not a boat, but it's a, it's a submersible kind of, uh, or a surface ship, if you will. I can't remember the term, but basically they were able to put a bunch of rapid deployables on there and they established coverage that had been wiped out on the island. So again, that's the long answer is we don't know, but we have a pretty good base of experience based on public safety, driving the narrative on what is needed and then having the private sector come in, big, small, because small companies are participating now in this and bringing in great ideas and then getting funding for those or departments funding their own and establishing better coverage for first responders nationwide, be it rural, be it urban, be it at sea, whatever it needs to be, where you need it, you got to have it. And that has been our premise all along is, you know, we need public safety needs the tools to do our job and hopefully government will respond to do this. And in this case, the government did in a big way. So we're very pleased with what, what's happened so far. So the challenges are ongoing and evolving, but I have to say, probably from the perspective of all of us listeners, uh, hearing hearing how things evolve, the fact that you surmounted so many challenges in the past, I think should lead to some optimism that FirstNet's going to continue to grow and continue to evolve into a more and more efficient and, and powerful force for public safety. So 
I want to thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to segment three of the story of the First Net Authority, part of the Precinct 444 podcast of the National Law Enforcement Museum. You just heard from Chris Moore, and here to conclude segment three is Sue Swenson. <laughs> so, Sue, I am going to ask you to just talk to your heart's content because I have a, you know, I have a number of questions, but it's really about me getting in listening mode along with the audience as much as possible. So don't uh, don't feel you have to have, you know, short clip responses, please. Just whatever occurs to you to say. OK. And, uh, so we're doing this a little bit unconventionally because, you know, we're not all in the studio at the same time. So I'm actually reporting directly through Teams. OK. You probably got a notification that it's being recorded. So that's just all that is. So, okay. Yep. It says recording has started. Yep. There we go. All right. I'm going to mute myself <laughs> and you guys can start whenever you're ready. Okay. And Sue, you can let me know when you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. It's delightful having you here as part of this podcast series. I wanted to ask you first about something going back in your past to childhood, probably. And that is, I know it took doggedness and commitment to get FirstNet off the ground. And it seems to me that came naturally from you. I mean, you were a competitive athlete, right? Yeah, I was. I swam competitively from age 12 all the way through college. So you had that sense uh, kind of inbred in you, so to speak, that uh, you, don't, you don't stop, you keep at it, and you're dogged. It's uh, something that we're going to discover, I think, during the course of the conversation, came in very handy. I know that in your preparation for this eventual role you had in growing and promoting FirstNet, that really had its roots on the commercial side of the industry for you. Can you talk a bit about your experiences prior to your involvement with FirstNet? Sure, I'd be happy to, Bill. Um, great experiences, so I'm happy to talk about it. I um through swimming, interestingly enough, I got introduced to something that was called the Management Development Program at Pacific Bell. Uh, my husband uh, was a coach for USS swim team um, in our community, and he also coached at a university. The parent, uh, they had a parents association, and the president of the parents association worked at Pacific Telesis and Pacific Bell. And he came to my husband one day and said, you don't really want to be a coach your whole life, do you? I mean, you don't, you know, you're not going to make much money doing that. And he thought, well, I kind of like it. <laughs> so it's not about the money. But he did come home that night and tell me about this program. And having worked at the county of San Diego for seven years and not sure where my future was there, I thought, well, it sounds pretty interesting. And I do have a tendency to explore things, um, that sound interesting. So I took a test, kind of like a little mini SAT test, did a couple of interviews, and I got hired on at Pacific Bell in their program, where I started in the business office as a service rep, actually here in San Diego, where I live today. Did that um, for a while, and then they promote you to supervisor if you pass that grueling test, because it's not easy. Um, and then I continued along uh, the path of that management development program for probably, Bill, probably about 11 years um, in a variety of positions. They tend to move you uh, from job to job probably every 18 months to two years, um, depending on how the organization is doing and which you're working. And so I did that. I, I went from the business office to a staff job, um, moved up to Los Angeles and did a variety of jobs there. And then it was time for me to go learn some things about the technical side of the business. And of course, I was thinking, well, I live in San Diego. It'd be great to be in San Diego or Orange County. But lo and behold, I ended up in downtown San Francisco. <laughs> so I uh, showed up there um, and was in a, an organization that actually did the uh, installation and repair of the networks and, and was generally focused on on business. And so kind of cut my teeth on the technical side of the business in that job. Um, did that for a couple of years and then ended up back in what you would consider to be, I think, sales and marketing. 
and um, and then moved around a couple of jobs. And then I got a call uh, one day from the gentleman who was the CEO of Pactel Companies. And he said, um, we'd like you to come over and be the CEO of Pactel Cellular. And to be honest, I actually hadn't been paying that much attention to what was happening in the wireless business. I was pretty much focused on, on the job at hand. And so I said, well, tell me, tell me a little something about it. And he said, I will after you say yes. And so um, I went and did that job for probably about three years, Bill. Um, really a great experience uh, because you were moving from a regulated side of the business to a deregulated uh, business where it was very competitive. Um, got very involved in the industry and actually represented the company on what's known as the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association on their board. And I co-chaired the technology committee uh, with another um, CEO of a, another wireless company in the U.S. So a great experience. Uh, went after, after completed about three years in that job, I went back to Pacific Bell. Uh, not by my choice. I would have stayed in the wireless business, but you know, being part of a program like that, you get moved around like a little chess piece. And so I went back to Pacific Bell and ran a business unit for about a year and then learned of an opportunity that was a joint venture between what was Pactel at the time and Macaw uh, Wireless, Craig Macaw. And it was a 50-50 joint venture uh, running a joint venture wireless company. And I thought that sounded pretty interesting. I had been exposed to the Macaw people um, when I had uh, been working at Pactel. And so I knew them, knew the, you know, knew the Pac Bell people. So I, I thought it would be a great opportunity. Um, I, I had the good fortune of getting that job, um, doing that job for about five years. And that was the length of the joint venture kind of contract. Um, knowing that that was coming to an end, um, there was an opportunity that came up in San Diego. You've heard of a company called Qualcomm, I'm sure. Uh, Qualcomm had spun off an entity called Leap Wireless, and they were the first kind of entry into what was unlimited wireless at the time, if you recall that. And, um, and so I was recruited into that job and did that for five years. Um, wow. Um, you were remarkably credentialed. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, it, it it sort of sounds like I couldn't keep a job, really. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, and then I ended up uh, up in Seattle uh, being the first chief operating officer of T-Mobile USA. Uh, I did that for a couple of years and then returned to Southern California. My last uh, real assignment um, as a CEO was working at a company called Sage Software, headquartered in the UK. It's a small business application software company. And ran that business for about three years and then retired in 2011. So I think uh, I had quite a tour uh, into a variety of positions and opportunities. And, you know, the, when the opportunity came along for FirstNet, Bill, you know, people say, well, how did you get involved in FirstNet? It yeah, was that's my next question. Yep, <laughs> exactly. It was serendipity. Um, the chairman of Pacific Telesis is a gentleman by the name of Sam Ginn. And Sam, I hadn't talked to Sam in years. He called me one day and said, hey, I'm getting involved in a really interesting project. He knew the Secretary of Commerce at the time. And I said, well, you know, can you tell me something about it? He said, well, I probably wouldn't do it justice. So you should talk to the Assistant Secretary of Commerce, Larry Strickling, which I did, and became instantly um, intrigued by what was happening, which, which eventually became FirstNet. So it was a you know, you just never know where your paths are going to take you or what opportunities present themselves. How did you first recognize the extent of the public safety need for this a dedicated broadband network? A great question. Um, you know, probably not for a while. Um, and I will tell you that I was stunned, actually stunned, having been in the wireless business, you know, for a good portion of my career, to learn that public safety didn't have the same capability that we were putting in the hands of, you know, 12 year olds, you know, to play games and, you know, navigation and all the things that we take for granted today. I was actually quite stunned probably within the first six months to learn that they were still using land mobile radio and had only voice communications. And so 
that, that became kind of a real mission for me is to change that. I thought, what a travesty to have public safety who is responsible for saving the lives of others and, of course, their fellow first responders and didn't have the same capability that we had as consumers. So it was quite an awakening bill um, and I think did a lot to probably cause me to say, we're going to make this happen. We have to make this happen. There is no choice. There is no failure here. And so um, it was it was it was quite an interesting uh, first learning at FirstNet. Would you say that your awakening to this need and the urgency with which you began to to view it was not widely shared, at least initially in the whole commercial network space that uh, I'm not suggesting you were necessarily a a lone ranger, but I'm sure there was a lot of conversation trying to get across the urgency to to those who were in the industry you had been in. Yeah, you know, it, it's it was interesting because when I got to know Chief Johnson, who was became my vice chair uh, when I became the chair of FirstNet, um, he educated me quite a bit about the history of how public safety had tried for so many years to accomplish what was then set out by the legislation from 2012, that that in fact, this journey had gone on for Bill, I think, a couple of decades, you know, different attempts to, to make this happen. So um, it was, I, I think the, the industry people who were on the board uh, from the industry, I think they understood the urgency and the and the situation at hand. But to your point, I don't think the broader industry had even any knowledge of it. And I think that, I, I think the industry felt, look, you're getting cellular service just like everybody else. What is the problem? So I don't think that they felt um, that there was a problem because they were using, public safety was using land mobile radio, but then they were also using personal cell phones as well to augment their land mobile radio. But but as you are learning, I think through these conversations, is that that was not adequate for them to do their job. And I don't think people understood why, why that wasn't adequate. I'm, I'm curious to get a little more into the what the sticking points were, what caused these false starts in the past. Was it a matter of not recognizing that it was going to take a public-private partnership? Was it about funding? Was it about just different views and perhaps even animosities between public safety and the commercial side? You know, I um, I don't believe that the commercial entities were that involved. I think, you know, I think other people that you may talk to probably have a better view on the history of what the false starts were. Uh, clearly, it took a sponsor like Senator Rockefeller and Senator Rockefeller's staff to understand what was required. But I think perhaps some of the some of the requests that were made in the past um, were not as comprehensive as this particular approach was. This particular approach not only took spectrum um, into account, but it also took funding. And as you know, the act also allocated $7 billion um, to the project to figure out a way to create a sustainable business model uh, so that additional funding would not be required. But I think there was probably a variety of, of things that got in the way. And I will tell you, I also think that perhaps in the past, public safety was not as cohesive as they were in this in the more recent attempt prior to 2012. As you know, public safety, I think for the first time in their history, came together as a public safety entity and, and worked together as an or, you know, as one organization. Because another thing I learned, Bill, is that public safety is pretty fragmented, not only amongst the different disciplines between fire, law enforcement, and EMS, but also within those agencies, you know, there's what, 60,000 agencies across the U.S. And so it's not, it, it is not one entity like a big company. You know, you think of 
public safety being a big entity. It's not. It's multiple different entities with different associations um, that represent the different interests. And I think um, I think public safety really has to be credited with coming together because I think honestly that's what's made the difference with our uh, our, our public. Um, uh, the public, you know, the the senators and the congressmen. I think that's what made the difference is that public safety came together as one entity and and fought for this as a as a as an entire entity. That's what I think made the difference. So uh, that's fascinating. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, but perhaps the the one thing that most of the public safety entities were united uh, around. Uh, and, and I think you even said it was a surprise to you, the extent of it, was their wariness toward the commercial carriers, that they wanted to build their own network, uh, which was a problematic uh, course, to, to be sure. Yeah, you raise a, a really good point. I don't think public safety was particularly happy with the wireless carriers because they were uh, probably fairly unresponsive uh, to the particular uh demands or needs of public safety. So um, so public safety at, at the beginning, as we were talking about enacting the legislation, there was a lot of conversation about we're going to build our own network. And of course, <laughs> having been in the industry for quite a while, by that time, I thought, well, none of you are going to be alive to see it <laughs> when it gets done. So we started having conversations then about what it really takes. I don't think, Bill, people who don't do this for a living have an appreciation of what it takes to, to, to one, create the network. They're very complex to maintain that network and to restore that network if there is a failure, because you are you have to recognize you're always going to have a cable dig or you're going to have um, central offices that go off air. You're going to have hurricanes. You're going to, you, you're going to have all kinds of incidents that take the network down. And I don't think public safety, because they had a, a relatively simple system, they also had control over their systems. They knew that it was Bill managing their LMR radio. They could call Bill and have Bill fix it. So the idea of having a large entity that was faceless to them, you know, probably concerned them. And I, I, I completely understand that. But on the other hand, I think we were able to convince them that to to build this, to maintain it, and to evolve it was going to take people who were very accomplished and understood technology and could evolve it to meet the needs of the public safety community in the future. And so we were able to finally get to that point. Um, I think what's important that, that probably a lot of people don't know is that to do the request for proposal that we did about providing this network, we went to every state, territory, and commonwealth that exists in the U.S. and, you know, belonging to the U.S. and talked to public safety, local, uh, local folks, and said, what do you want your network to be? And I think that started to change, Bill, I think, the attitude that this was really going to be a network that was uh, was designed by and built for public safety, really with their needs in mind and not just some general network that was, you know, built for, you know, commercial purposes. But it did take some convincing and and people were appropriately skeptical. I mean, that didn't bother me. I just knew it would take some time to get people to understand how important that was. And I think the evidence today demonstrates, obviously, that that, that was the right approach. And I think e even asking public safety today, I think they realize that building their own network was just a non-starter. But they didn't know it at the time. You know, part and, of it's knowledge. And And you had convincing to do on the other side of the equation, right? I mean, the commercial carriers were definitely hesitant to get in bed with the federal government. Is that, is that true? Uh, that's a very fair statement, Bill. Um, we did, you know, the federal government has some interesting rules. I had to learn a lot about 
things like the federal acquisition rules, the called the FAR, affectionately called the FAR. Um, we had to learn about hiring employees. I, I know this sounds unbelievable to people who may be listening to this, but it would take us about 18 months from the time we identified a position that we needed to hire and actually hiring the person. So there was a lot of frustration, um, you know, in terms of having to follow all the, you know, the the federal rules that that we had to follow. But that was just part of what had to be done, Bill. There was a lot of convincing. Frankly, there was convincing on Capitol Hill. It wasn't uncommon for us to every couple of weeks go over and make a couple of visits to different senators and, and members of Congress to talk about the project. Because as, as we live in a very, as you know, political world, there was a point of view that a network needed to be done, but there was a point of view on how it should be done. One side of the aisle wanted it to be done one way, the other side of the aisle wanted it to be done another way. So we had lots of constituencies to convince that we had a plan that was going to work and that we had a plan that was going to meet the needs of all the constituencies. So it was a multifaceted but fascinating job <laughs> to uh, to deal with all of those entities. But but we were able to persuade them, you know, at and, the end. And, and you have mentioned in the past this uh, extremely valuable relationship uh, with Chief Jeff Johnson teaming up, hitting the road. You, you've said, in fact, that it made all the difference for you. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about those? You you you, you mentioned reaching out and, and uh, speaking to audiences like the International Association of Chiefs of Police, mm -hmm. uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs, various agencies. What was that like? What kinds of reactions were you, were you getting and, and what did it take to mollify whatever uh, concerns they had? You know, it's, uh, I, I do have fond memories of those road trips. It was actually Chief Johnson's idea. Um, I give him a, listen, I, I don't think FirstNet would have been successful without his counsel and advice. As you know, he was one of the, the original people who got the legislation done. And so he had a great understanding of audiences and communication. So he said, look, let's get on the road. Let's go meet with the executive councils or whatever their titles are, um, the executive forum of each of these organizations and talk to them about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and answer their questions. And, um, and I would tell you that I think one of the biggest concerns is that like your comment earlier about commercial concern about dealing with the federal government, I think I think the public safety entities were very concerned about dealing with the federal government because I think their history had been, and I don't have a lot of experience with federal projects, but their recollection was projects are never get it done on time. They're over budget. They never deliver what they promise. And so it was pretty negative to be honest, I mean, pretty negative about how is this going to be different? And so, you know, Jeff just let me talk to him about my vision of how we were going to develop the organization and the philosophy that we were going to use and that we were bringing that commercial um, kind of experience and, and we were going to do everything we could to minimize the federal impact and run it like, like you would run a business and be responsive to your customers. And so they heard that. I think they were pleasantly surprised um, by the approach. Um, and I think you've you've probably chatted with Chief McEwen, but Chief McEwen it was at one of those meetings and he said afterwards that that's exactly, that was, that he said refreshing is the word I think, refreshing that, that we would even be considering that. Um, so I think that, paid real dividends. Now, that was a lot of talking and we actually had to deliver. So the good news was we were saying the things that they wanted to hear. Now we just had to deliver. And I'll go back to your comment about the commercial bill, because I, I think I didn't answer that completely. But on the commercial side, yes, we did have to convince people to be interested to do this. Now, just think about if you're 
AT&T or your Verizon or your T-Mobile or any wireless carrier, you're going to have the opportunity, of course, to get 20 megahertz of spectrum to use somehow. You're going to potentially get $7 billion to help fund that project. But I would tell you the largest concern that was voiced to us was it was the fact that the project sat within the federal government. And, and Randall Stevenson was the CEO of AT&T at the time. And he said to me, and I can remember, I remember the meeting vividly, you know, what's it going to be like, Sue, to work with the federal government? And so, again, like we told the IACP Executive Council, we said, here's how we plan to run it, Randall, you know, and, and sure, it's going to be challenging, but I think we're going to, we're going to look at it as a public-private partnership instead of it being a vendor contract kind of relationship. Because I think, I think, Bill, that's where the rub comes because people feel like they're treated like a vendor and not a partner. And, and I will tell you that that concept was even challenging for some of our subsequent board members that came on because we talked about this. We wanted a public-private partnership and let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about how we execute on that. And even some of the new board members were saying, why do we need a partnership? We have a contract. <laughs> and I said, mm -hmm. well, you know, I think when you have a contract with a vendor, you get the minimum. You get the minimum from somebody. You know, they'll look at the contract and they say, we'll give you what we committed to. What we were looking for, Bill, was a lot more than that. You know, we were entering into a relationship to serve the first responders of our country. And this, to me, had a different perspective. This was, a, this was an opportunity to do something more than being a vendor. It was committing to committing to something for your country. I mean, think about it. There's so many people who serve in the military. Uh, this is a way for people to kind of give back. And, and I will tell you that I really think that this has impacted the culture of AT&T, just to know that they're doing something bigger than going to their job every day. They're doing something that makes a difference, um, that you have a mission, you know, and I'll tell you, Bill, I think that um, there were days, you know, it's hard, you know, human nature is interesting. It helps you forget the really bad days and, and you remember the good days, but having a mission is what kept us on course and not letting a setback or somebody telling us no or um, saying you can't do that because that's generally what we heard. Knowing that we were on a mission is what motivated the organization to do what it did, very frankly. And, you know, I, I found myself recalling a story you've told uh, back when you were mentioning the, the wariness about the government and its view of time frames, you know, they can they can work in geologic time. Yes. You were testifying before the Senate and you were asked, could you get this done within 10 years? Can you tell that uh, story? Because I think that's kind of revealing about uh, the sense of urgency you had versus the haste that perhaps the government's more used to. Yeah, it was a it, it was a really a great day. I mean, you know, I guess testifying in front of Senate, people don't view as a, you know, they view it as like being called by 60 minutes, maybe, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I actually look forward to it. Uh, it was fairly early in the project. I'm trying to remember what year it was. I can't remember exactly. But I was pretty involved just because as board members, we had to be a little bit more involved in the early days. So um, went to the hearing, you know, it was about two and a half hours. Senator Thune was the chair um, variety of questions, you know, being asked by the senators. And towards the very end, the senator, and I, I apologize, I can't remember who asked me the question. It was a woman sitting on the left, and I think she represented a more rural um, part of the country. And she, she said, um, do, you, do you think you can get this done in the time that the license, you know, which is 10 years? And I, I thought for a second and gave her a very polite answer about the project. By the way, it was on time and on budget, which they, which is what they aren't used to. Um, 
Senator Thune asked as an aside, he said, could you run another project I have in mind? I said, no, this one keeps me quite busy. But then I thought, you know what? I have to, I have to respond. I just said, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator. If we can't get this done in that amount of time, we should all be shot. And, you know, I, she, she just didn't quite know how to respond to that. Uh, we had a lot of public safety people in the audience that day. And, you know, they were, of course, quite pleased that that would be the, you know, the response. Um, and that has, that quote um, has been, has been used several times. People say, look, we, we knew we had to do it or else he was shoot, so he was going to shoot us if we didn't get it done. But I think it did, Bill, represent the sense of commitment and urgency about getting it done. And very frankly, um, you know, and, and the way AT&T deployed the network, um, I mean, I knew they could get it done in a relatively short period of time because it was just a matter of taking the radios and putting them on the existing infrastructure that they had across the nation. It wasn't like you had to build a tower, um, which takes forever. And so I knew it could be done. So um, I thought I needed to tell her just what I thought. <laughs> and uh, and it was a memorable, that was a memorable way to end the, uh, the Senate hearing. I know that uh, you had a series of large hurdles and resistance points, you might say, at various stages. I mean, you had to bid out to a wireless carrier and that had to be successful. You had to get state plans finalized and off to governors. You had to engage with local, state, federal, mm -hmm. even tribal organizations. The, maybe an unfair question, but can you rank for us what was most difficult among those things or were they all just challenging but in their own ways? Yeah, I, I wouldn't rank them. I think they were all challenging in their uh, in their own way. Uh, every 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 phase um, of the project was challenging. But you know what we did, much to Sam Ginn's credit, Sam Ginn was the first chair of FirstNet. Um, to his credit, he came to me fairly early in the project, and he said, "So, you know, I mean, think about it, Bill. We had legislation, and that was it." just words on a piece of paper that said, this is how you have to do this. And of course, it had never been done before. And he said, Sue, why don't you put together a strategic plan, you know, for the organization so that one, the organization has a clear roadmap on, on the steps they need to take to reach the destination. And that also it becomes a vehicle to communicate to external stakeholders what to expect. Because what was happening is that people were saying, you're going too slow. And on the other side of it, people were saying, you're going too fast. And so we thought, well, let's explain <laughs> the pace we're going so that people will understand when we reach a milestone or, you know, whatever, that we can create the right expectation. That was probably one of the best things we ever did um, because we communicated that roadmap uh, we did it actually in New York. We were visiting uh, Chief Dowd uh, was our host. We were at NYPD and we uh, unveiled the strategic roadmap at that meeting. And and it was, like I said, the best thing we ever did, not only for the organization, but for the external stakeholders, because then we could communicate. We've met this milestone. We've met this milestone. So we were able to build confidence along the way that we were doing what we said we were on schedule and we were on budget, which again is a rare, a rare outcome, you know, for a federal project. So I think they were all, they were all very challenging. I think, um, I think one of them, I, when I think back on it, I think the, the thing that you had to get used to was um, sitting inside the federal government. We sat inside the department of commerce and, we had a lot of great support from there. And I, I want to give a shout out to actually Assistant Secretary Larry Strickling because he he has to be given a lot of credit for how the board was created, for who got uh, seated on that board. You know, we had the right combination of people, but everything was, everything took so long. It, I, I, you know, when you come from the commercial world, you're used to making a decision and executing I mean, almost immediately. And the federal government, 
there is everything is a long process. And I think that was probably the hardest thing to get used to. And generally, when you asked about something, the first answer was no. And so you had to get used to no and say, okay, fine, let's figure out a way to do it now that you've said no. But I think each of the each of those milestones, um, you know, uh, because we had that strategic roadmap, it created a real focus for the organization. They knew exactly what they had to do. They knew exactly when they needed to get it done. And so it just became the next, you know, the next big challenge that, you know, that had to be accomplished. So I think they were all, I think they were all very, very, very difficult. Yeah. And and you were moving on so many fronts with regard to stakeholders. I'm curious to ask, did you find that it was important to get certain stakeholders on board to induce others to climb on? In other words, was there some thinking like, if this domino can fall, that one will fall, et cetera? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it was most important to me to get public safety comfortable with our plan and be comfortable that we were going out to bid to get a wireless carrier to be the provider. To me, that was the most important thing. And having them be supportive has a huge impact on other constituencies because, because obviously they're going to get approached by whomever, you know, from XYZ office, you know, uh, senator, uh, XYZ congressman, and they're going to say, you know, they're going to ask them, how are you all feeling about that? So knowing that they were comfortable with what was happening, I think, made all the difference in the world. They were and continue to be and frankly should be. It's their network. Um, it's their network. They need to feel good about it. We're, we were only the stewards, Bill. I think that was one of the hardest things, I think, for people to recognize because you know usually when people have a project they kind of start to own it as their own and we had to continue to remind people remember this is public safety's network they fought for it they you know they provided input into what they wanted they continue to do that and i will you know i'll just be really candid i my biggest concern is success is great but success breeds complacency and it happens, as you know, whether it's a sports team or a company or anything. And I think if I could, if I could leave any message with the public safety community, and I say it all the time, so this is not the only place I'm saying it, is that public safety needs to continue to um, know that this is their network. Uh, this is not a project that is done. A network is never done. It continues to evolve. And, and they need to continue to, through the various avenues that they have, continue to fight for an evolution of their network. They should never, ever, ever again be behind from a technological perspective. But they can't just assume it's going to happen. I think they need to continue to fight like they did before. And I think I think they know that. But I would just encourage them to understand that and continue to push AT&T for improvements, continue to uh, push AT&T and frankly, the rest of the industry for innovation, because having this broadband network has opened up so many different innovations. Think, you know, when you look at, I think the app catalog now has over 200 applications that are designed for public safety, that never would have happened without FirstNet. I think there's over 500 devices with band 14 in them. Bill, at the very beginning, people said, well, who's going to build a device for this? And we said, well, we believe, we believe that they will. Well, here we are, you know, X number of years later, and there's over 500 devices. But you have to be careful to not assume that things will continue on the path. Um, and and so I think what causes success for FirstNet is something that people need to look at and say, we need to continue to band together as public safety and continue to fight for what we need and, and because it is their network. I mean, I'm a little bit on a bandstand here a little bit. I apologize, but I wanted to take the opportunity to say it's really, really important 
that we don't sit back and, and become complacent. No, that makes perfect sense. And the accomplishments have been remarkable. I mean, when you think about FirstNet having been a laggard in terms of, of adopting technologies to now being in the forefront of some, in fact, isn't it the case that FirstNet has capabilities that the commercial networks don't have? Yes, because of Band 14, uh, and, and as part of the contract, we made sure that one of the things we wanted to have for public safety was um, vertical location capability. As you know, we have horizontal capability today, you know, where people can find people on a horizontal basis, but not on a vertical. So as a result of FirstNet, you have something that's called Z-axis, so that in a, in a particularly in a fire situation where you have your resources in a building, and you want to know where those resources are to be able to make sure one, they're okay, or to rescue them if they're not. Um, you have that capability today. And then because of the power level in band 14, and it's the only network that has this, they have something called mega range, which extends the network beyond kind of its normal, normal course. Um, so it does have, it does have things that other commercial networks um, don't have. And, and I also think that in the future, you know, to me, there's one additional capability that I think is just on the horizon. And you can imagine, obviously, law enforcement and fire and EMS often go into buildings, right? I mean, you've been in hospitals and other locations where your coverage is not very good. And I think that's kind of the next frontier is that in-building capability. Uh, uh, is going to be an innovation that's going to make a huge difference for public safety because they're limited today in terms of the coverage they have in buildings. So more to come um, uh, from that. And I think innovation will continue, uh, will continue. You know, when you look at the FirstNet program and you look at the things like the deployables that they use in incidents and planned events. So let's say there's the Albuquerque balloon event and you've got hundreds of thousands of people there. And so you need additional capacity. So FirstNet can actually deploy what you call satellite uh, sat cults or satellite cell on light trucks. Uh, but they also now have the capability to create a network with a drone. They have very large drones that can actually create a network at an incident where let's say there's been damage to the, to the infrastructure. And then they also have an aerostat, uh, which, you know, is a little, you know, like a little the mini Goodyear blimp, you know, it's a little one and uh, it can take the coverage. And I think it actually covers what three to five cults would do, you know, the SAC cults would do. So AT&T is continuing to really innovate in areas like that, that, that they wouldn't necessarily have been interested in doing before as a result of that. So they're pushing the envelope as well, not, not necessarily always by public safety, they are exploring all kinds of opportunities to make the service better for public safety. And those are just a couple of examples. Um, you know, and they're doing something, as you know, um, and I'm sure talking to others in the in the public safety community, you know, mental health is a, you know, is a challenge in the country today, but particularly with with first responders. And AT&T, I mean, this isn't a technical innovation, but I think you've probably heard of the ROG dog. Have you heard of the ROG dog? Yeah, I have. And um, and I think that's pretty innovative. You know, it doesn't always have to be technology, but looking at, again, the full needs of public safety, I think that's that's an innovation that, you know, I've seen comments from first responders who have interacted with those animals and what a difference it makes, you know, for them, you know, in the in the course of their work. So, I think innovation is going to come in a lot of different in a lot of different ways. That's an exciting prospect. Well, a final final question for you, Sue. Looking back over these years of your involvement with FirstNet, what would you say you're most proud of in terms of your contribution to the process? Well, that's a that's a hard question. Um, you know, to me, I think it's accomplishing what people said was impossible. I, I mean, I've had people say to me afterwards, even journalists say, Sue, I have to tell you, I never thought it would happen. You know, and I kind of, you know, and I, I, I always am a little surprised by that because in my mind, Bill, 
it was always possible, you know? And so uh, to, to have accomplished what people thought was the impossible and what a difference it's making in our country is probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Um, my family has um, been involved in the, if served in the military. I mean, if you combine all of the years of service, it's probably in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 years, you know, in total service. I didn't serve in the military, but I feel like I finally had the opportunity to serve my country uh, through this project. And it'll, it'll be, um, and, and I think you know that I'm continuing to work with public safety. You know, I'm, uh, they have officially adopted me, which I think quite to be quite an honor, um, you know, to be adopted into that. You know, it's a very tight knit uh, organization. But I um, I continue to work with public safety on uh, continuing initiatives that will further uh, their capability in the future. Um, as long as I can, I want to make sure that they don't get left behind. Well, we are all grateful for your service to public safety. And I want to thank you for being with us today and sharing your insights. Well, Bill, it was my pleasure, and I um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to share my perspective, and, and thanks for doing this. I think it's important for people to know more about it. Thank you for tuning into segment three of the story of the First Net Authority, where we learned of the arduous task of convincing political figures and public safety organizations alike that FirstNet needs to happen. We hope that you learned something from this segment and will continue to check out segment four as we conclude the story of FirstNet. This has been an exclusive Precinct 444 podcast series for the FirstNet Authority. A very special thanks to Bill Beeman, our special guest host. And as always, thank you to Christopher Mitchell for producing this series on the history of the FirstNet Authority. Please subscribe to Precinct 444 on your favorite podcasting platform to stay connected and to receive our latest content as soon as it drops. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, comments, and feedback to precinct444 at nleomf.org. You can help us make our content even better. The National Law Enforcement Museum is located at 444 East Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and is dedicated to telling the story of American law enforcement. We expand and enrich the relationship between law enforcement and the community through educational journeys, immersive exhibitions, and insightful programs. Find us online at lawenforcementmuseum.org and stay tuned for more podcast content from Precinct 444. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you at the precinct. Thank you.